students last week and they should have gotten a little postcard that has uh, information for registration and it's also something that can be mailed on to somebody else that you'd want to invite as well and I have extras of those um, they can be found on the little table um, in the entrance way as well if you're interested in more and if they're all gone please talk to me I will gladly make more uh, one unique thing about that too this year as we're going forward um, and our students are, are working hard at putting that week together and we want to be uh, a lot more organized and strategic uh, this year with the adults that are going to be able to be present. So last year when they did it, there was a handful of adults who were here and just kind of standing there thinking like, well, this is amazing, but I don't have anything to do, and which was a decent problem to have. But this year we really want to be intentional of, of figuring out how we can partner with the adults um, so it's not just the students because we do need the adult voices as well. So to facilitate that, we are asking that if you are an adult who is willing to volunteer, um, please register as well so that we can uh, appropriately plan for that. Another thing that I would like to highlight, a couple of items coming up. First of all, we have in uh, several weeks, or a couple weeks here, um, the Walking with Families, previously the Care Clinic Life Walk fundraiser. Uh, I know that in years past, it's something that my family has intended to, to go to as well, and we've enjoyed that time together. Um, last year as we were walking, one of the things that we thought through with O was just that it would really be great to have a lot bigger representation um, just from, from the body of Christ to say, you know what, this is a big issue and, and we care about this. We care about supporting moms and crisis and supporting uh, people choosing life. So I just want to encourage you guys as a congregation to pray about the opportunity that that is of just walking together. Um, they're very casual. It's not like you have to work up a huge sweat or anything, but um, that might be just a great time to show up and support uh, just with your presence. And I know that we also have someone in our congregation, Val Potenin, who is working on raising funds for that too. So if you feel like you want to support her in that, uh, please feel free to do so as well. One more thing to talk through before we, we start is, uh, you might have saw some of the pictures up here, um, and there's a bulletin on the announcement board in the fellowship line as well. But UP City Fest is coming up in June, end of June, beginning of July. I think it's July 1st. Um, and I just want to uh, make a plug for that as well. In order for this to happen and for this to be a success, it takes the church being together as the body of Christ. And we have an opportunity to come to a, a venue where the gospel is going to be presented. And, and they have a need for people to pray, a need to people to pray with people who might be being touched with the gospel and needing to be introduced to Jesus. And so I want to invite you as a congregation to consider that opportunity as well. Um, there is an email you can get in touch with if you're interested in volunteering. I know last year we had a few people uh, be trained on the witnessing evangelism part of things. We can do that again. Uh, but please prayerfully consider those opportunities that we have um, as we look to the future as well. With that, uh, is there any other announcements that need to be made at this time? Okay, let's open our service in prayer. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in this day. Lord God, it is a, a day that is full of your goodness and your mercy. Lord, it is a day that you have chosen to sustain us once again, to grant us life to renew your mercies and forgiveness. And for that, we give you praise. Lord, I pray that each one of us would have our eyes open to your work as we gather and as we spend our time together today, to see your hand, to know, Jesus, that you are active in our lives and in the world that we inhabit, Lord Jesus. We pray for your spirit to be moving in our hearts, to draw us closer to you, but Lord, also to be at work in our neighborhoods. Uh, Lord, that you'd be preparing people for gospel conversations to hear about the good news of the gospel. And Lord, you'd be moving in our hearts to share that same word with those that are around us every day. Uh, Father, we pray for you to be glorified and honored through this service, through our hearts and their worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we get started, I'm hopping between mics here. I hope that's okay. Um, we're going to start with continuing what we started last week. I'm going to call up Arvo forward today and uh, the Stone family too, if you'd be willing to come up here. Um, last week Arvo was sick, so he wasn't able to be here for his presentation of uh, our Bible Buddy presentation. And uh, so we want to take care of that this morning too. 
So as a reminder for those who weren't here last week, we have outgoing fourth graders. So you ready for the fifth grade? Mm -hmm. The big handful of years, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as he's going into fifth grade, we have um, Jan and John Stone who have committed to be praying for him and supporting him throughout this journey. And we're so <coughs> thankful for them. And uh, they have gotten you this Bible, Arvo. And it is uh, one of the best gifts that you could ever receive because in it we have God's word for you. And we want to start by praying for you this morning, okay? Heavenly Father, we lift Arvo to you, Jesus. He is your creation whom you love desperately, who you pursue with your love and who you've died for and rose for. And we pray that as he enters into these older years, God, that you would prepare his path and reveal, Lord, your calling for him as you uh, invade his life with your presence. I pray for the stones as well as I faithfully lift him up to you in prayer. Uh, God, that they would be having their hearts knit together with his. And Jesus, that you'd be honored and glorified through this amazing relationship. We thank you for the body of Christ, the church that you've given us, Lord, and how this can be a, a small reflection of that. And we just pray for, for the future, God, and all that you would do in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. And as we continue on, we get to the part that's got a lot of nerves for some people this morning. We have the culmination of two years of study with our confirmation students, and it's an honor to, to go through with this with them this morning. And so as we begin this confirmation process, uh, it's going to look a little different this year than we have done in previous years, but it's going to be good still. So we're going to start off with Miss Abby Karenin. She's going to do her statement of faith at this time. Good morning. My name is Abigail Kiernan, and I just finished two years of confirmation taught by Jordan Likeness. Confirmation has been such an incredible experience for me. I've learned so many things, and I am so grateful to have been given the opportunity to work through all the different topics we've covered throughout these two years. As I was writing this, I started to ponder on a question Jordan asked us. His question was, why are you attending confirmation? A few different thoughts ran through my head. I thought of confirmation as the next step after Sunday school. All my older siblings did it, so it was my turn. And I was there because my parents told me to be. I didn't really have a strong desire to attend confirmation because I was really nervous about it. I thought it was going to be difficult and scary. At first, I didn't know how to answer his question. As I worked through my first year, I learned a lot and also got a better, better understanding of most of the things we covered. I learned that confirmation wasn't hard or scary, but that it was a great opportunity to walk through God's word and talk about any questions we had. As I started my second year, I was excited to learn. I wanted to be there. Jordan asked the same question again at the start of the second year. My answer was clearer now. I wanted to grow my faith in God and strengthen my relationship with him. As my second year came to an end, I decided that a close relationship with God was very important to me, and that was why I attended confirmation. I have applied so much of what I've learned to my life, and I will continue to do so with different parts of scripture in different areas of my life. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Attending church and confirmation is a great example of this verse. I cannot wait to see how God continues to grow my faith in him and how he will guide my next steps. Thank you for all your support, encouragement, and prayers. Thank you, Jordan, for being willing to teach us and also answer our questions. I am so grateful to be a part of God's family here at Hope Free. God bless you. Thank you. All right, do you prefer Abigail in these official settings, or is Abby okay? Okay. So Abby, um, the verse that I chose for you, for your confirmation verse, is from Proverbs 31.30, and it says this, Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Now, I didn't choose this verse for you because I think that you try to be charming or vain in your beauty. That's not where I was going, but just that second half especially of a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. 
And I just think of the life that you have before you and all the different opportunities you have to pursue different things. But I know that your foundation is going to give you a foundation that is going to make you worthy of that praise as you continue to fear the Lord. Excuse me. So uh, I pray that that would be an encouragement for you as you continue on in your faith journey. So now, beloved in the Lord, you have been baptized into the Christian faith. And in that faith, you have received instruction. May the Lord, through his Holy Spirit, grant you a living faith that you may be able to boldly confess before God and in this congregation the confidence that you have in Jesus Christ. Are you ready for your vows? Okay. Now, Abby, do you renounce the devil and all of his works and all of his ways? I do. Do you believe in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I do. I have too many papers. Do you promise to remain faithful to the teaching of the Christian church and in the use of the means of grace? I do. Give me your right hand as a sign of your commitment of these promises. It's a handshake. We can... <laughs> this is what I told them. We got like an awkward handshake here. All right. May the triune God, who in holy baptism has adopted you as his child and has made you an heir of eternal life, preserve you in the grace of your baptism and grant you steadfastness in your faith to the salvation of your soul. We have a gift from the congregation for you, and you'll receive your official certificate a little bit later. I think the ink is drying on them, uh, so we will get that to you during fellowship time. Uh, you can have a seat at this time. And now we're going to call on McKenna for her statement of faith. Good morning. If you don't know me, my name is McKenna Olson. I've been going to this church regularly since I was around seven years old, but I've always had God in my life. But at times I've had a feeling he isn't around me, and that's when I started to feel unsafe. That's when I know that God's always with me, especially when I'm struggling. God has put me through times where I've struggled. Over a year ago, a boy in my grade shot himself a few doorways down from where I was. To this day, I still talk to God about him, and I'm still getting over it. But I know God's by my side through all of it. My dad went to a Lutheran church when he was younger, so thankfully when I was at home and had any questions, he was sure to answer them. I thank him for helping me in my walk with faith. I, still, I will never forget how great the people at this church treat me. When I'm here, I feel safe, and I thank the congregation for being so nice, even when you don't want to be, because let's be honest, we all have those days when we just want to be by ourselves. I have a favorite verse, and it's Luke 23, 34, and it says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. This has stuck with me because, especially at my age, we do things without realizing the effect it can have on others or ourselves. I can't wait to continue my walk with God at this church, and I won't forget the kindness you guys all have. Thank you. The verse that I have for you is from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. And when I read it, I hope you're not too surprised, okay? And it says this, For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And McKenna, this verse was chosen for you partly because you're such a baller, and I know how much you throw yourself into all these things like sports and stuff like that. And I just want to encourage you, like, that same tenacity to pursue your faith and to grow and to remember that it's great for this life, but also for the life to come. McKenna, you've been baptized into the Christian faith, and in that faith you've received instruction. May the Lord, through his Holy Spirit, grant you a living faith that you may be able to boldly confess before God in this congregation the confidence that you have in Jesus Christ. Do you renounce the devil and all of his works and all of his ways? I do. Do you believe in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I do. Do you promise to remain faithful to the teaching of the Christian church and in the use of the means of grace? I do. Give me your right hand as a sign of your commitment of those promises. May the triune God, who in holy baptism has adopted you as his child and has made you an heir of eternal life, preserve you in the grace of your baptism and grant you steadfastness in your faith to the salvation of your souls. Amen. Yes. Similarly, we have a gift for you as well. Thanks. Thank you. You may be seated. Taylor? Good morning. My name is Taylor. I have attended Hope Free my entire life. 
I've known since I was younger that I would go through confirmation, but I never realized how beneficial it is for understanding the foundation of your faith. I have learned so much these past few years, but one thing in particular that has stood out to me is the fact that Christ is the only way we are saved. We are not saved by who we are or the things that we do, but we are saved through the work of Christ dying on the cross for our sins. A verse that I like is Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. I like this verse because it shows that our relationship with God is so important because it is through him that we are saved. Going through confirmation has increased my faith and has made my relationship with Christ stronger. I've also learned ways that I can spread God's word so that others can know him and be saved. I'll continue to grow my faith going forward in life, and I can't wait to see what God has planned for me in my future. I am so thankful for Jordan teaching me in confirmation and for my family and friends who have supported me through all that I do. Well, Taylor, you're so special that you got more than one verse. So um, here's what I have for you. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated in the right hand of the throne of God. Now, Taylor, there's something about you that I do not understand, and that is that you like long-distance running. Um, not my world. But, as this verse says, talking about running the race before us with endurance. And I pray that as you continue your faith, that you will have that same endurance, going strong for the Lord, all the way to the last lap when you do your final kick-in. So may you be strengthened and encouraged in Him. Taylor, you have been baptized in the, to the Christian faith, and in that faith you've received instruction. May the Lord through his Holy Spirit grant you a living faith that you may be able to boldly confess before God and this congregation the confidence that you have in Jesus Christ. Taylor, do you renounce the devil in all of his works and all of his ways? I do. Do you believe in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I do. Do you promise to remain faithful to the teaching of the Christian church and in the use of the means of grace? I do. Give me your right hand as a sign of your commitment to these. May the triune God who in holy baptism has adopted you as his child and made you an heir of eternal life preserve you in the grace of your baptism and grant you steadfastness into your faith to the salvation of your soul. Amen. On behalf of our congregation, here is a gift for you. Thank you. And Kenzie. Good morning. When I was younger, around to when I was born to nine years old, me and my family went to a different church. I got baptized there, some of my other family went there, and I basically grew up there. After a few years of being at that church, my parents decided it just wasn't the right church for us to be at. There were even a few times when my mom didn't want to go to church anymore, but she didn't want to give up on her faith. After a few months of not going to church, we found hope. As soon as I came here, I knew this was the right church for me and my family to be at. Everyone was so welcome, and there were lots of kids my age. I also wanted to learn more about God and get closer to Him. So me and my family started going to church regularly, and I started going to Sunday school. I was about 10 years old at the time, but I was kind of just messing around, letting everything that was said to me and taught to me fly right past me. After my Sunday school years, I joined Confirmation. This was a point in my life where I was serious about growing my faith. I got a few devotionals, and I've been starting to read parts of the Bible. There are some parts of the Bible that are very confusing and that I just don't understand. But as my mom has always said to me, no one is going to be perfect in their faith. She has always said that learning about God and spending time with Him is a lifelong journey. God has helped me through so much, and He always will. At the start of Confirmation, I thought that it was going to go by super slow, but here we are now. I got a book from my prayer partner, Teresa, and she wrote something in it that really stood out to me. She wrote, God has a purpose for your life. At times, it may be hard to recognize what that may be. God knows and will help you realize what that is as long as you keep close to him and wait for him to reveal it to you. Actively seek him in all your ways. God is everything you need. I will always think of that when I am going through a hard time or if I ever lose sight of God. So thank you to each and every one of you for helping me and guiding me in my journey, especially Jordan. I want to close out my statement by saying a Bible verse from Proverbs 4.23. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life.
So, Kenzie, the verse that I have chosen for you is Luke chapter 1, verse 45. And it says this, And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now, obviously, I'm not expecting you to birth a Savior, uh, the context of that verse, but I do pray that as you live each day, that your life would be lived in faith and trust that God will bring all of his promises to you to pass and that you'd be living in that hope. So, Kenzie, you've been baptized into the Christian faith, and in that faith you've received instruction. May the Lord, through his Holy Spirit, grant you a living faith that you may be able to boldly confess before God and this congregation the confidence that you have in Jesus Christ. Kenzie, do you renounce the devil and all of his works and all of his ways? I do. Do you believe in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I do. And do you promise to remain faithful to the teaching of the Christian church and in the use of the means of grace? I do. Okay, give me your right hand in commitment to these promises. May the triune God who in holy baptism has adopted you as his child and made you an heir of eternal life preserve you in the grace of your baptism and grant you steadfastness in your faith to the salvation of your soul. Amen. Here is a gift from the congregation. I want you to put that back real quick. And at this time, um, our confirmands have, throughout the year, uh, they've each had a prayer partner for them, and it's been a special connection that, that I've been able to watch over the years. And what we're going to do now is we're going to call all the confirmands forward, their parents and their prayer partners as well. So for Abby, we're going to call your parents and, and Brandy Jensen forward. And then for McKenna, your parents and Miss Nancy. And then Taylor, your parents, and then Anne. And then for Kenzie, uh, oh, I, yeah, Teresa. Your parents and Teresa. So come and stand up front here, please. So we're going to do like the whole official thing, and then we will close in prayer, and I'll get myself out of the way. Okay. To all of our confirmation students, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you have confessed and promised to serve, and on behalf of Hope Free Lutheran Church, I hereby authorize you to receive the Lord's Supper and invite you to participate in all the spiritual privileges of this congregation. Congratulations. And let us pray. Father God, as we gather this morning and we honor you and celebrate, Lord, what is happening in the lives of these students as they publicly make a declaration of faith before this congregation, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would continue to nurture that faith in each of their hearts as it grows. Uh, we also remember Kaylee, who can't be here this morning because of illness. We pray that you would have mercy on her and bring healing to her. Um, but Lord, I, I pray that you would be glorified and honored in each one of these students' lives. And as Kenzie reminded us, God, you have a plan for each one. And Lord, as we live our life and we go forward, I pray that you would reveal that plan day by day to us, step by step, that we walk in faith according to your spirit and thereby bring glory and honor to you. Jesus, we rejoice in these students. We praise you for their creation and for their faith, and we give all the glory and honor to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. At this time, we ask that you join us by standing and singing our first hymn together, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus.
may be seated. One of the things that the confirmation students learn throughout the year, and especially as we think about our preparation for the Lord's table, is self-examination. That's an opportunity that we get to engage in as a whole congregation this morning as we turn our minds to our own hearts and to our confession of sins and ask that you would join us as we corporately confess those sins together. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. Amen. As we bring before the Lord the sin in our own life, I want you to hear the promise that we receive from the Lord, from his word, that if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our Christian faith now in the words, oh, that's later. So at this point, I'm going to call on our lector for the reading of God's word. Good morning. Uh, would you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, we thank you for gathering us here together this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, we thank you for the privilege it is to gather together and welcome the confirmands uh, fully into the church, Father. We thank you that uh, you've been faithful with them, Father, pouring out your Holy Spirit upon them, leading and guiding them through this time. And Father, as a church, we just pray that you lead and guide us as well as we mentor them uh, in their journey as well. Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity as well to gather together this morning and receive the benefits of your Holy Supper. Father, we thank you for Pastor and for the message you prepared for him. And now, Father, as we look at your word, we again ask you to pour your Holy Spirit upon us that we might learn and understand what you have for us this morning. We pray these things in your name. Amen. If you would please rise. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 1, verses 12. Uh, through 26, reading in Jesus' name. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these were with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up amongst the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture has to be fulfilled, which of the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us, and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle of all that, with his bowels gushing out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called, uh, in their own language, Akeldama, that is, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it and let the others take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from his baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to this resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Here ends the reading. Our epistle reading then is from 1 Peter, 
uh, chapter 4, verses 12 through 19, and then continuing with chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Again, reading in Jesus' name. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you have Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad with his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God uh, in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust his souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now our gospel reading comes from John chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I have with you before the world existed. I have manifest your name to the people who you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and now they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and they have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Here ends the reading. If you would now join together with me in corporate confession of faith and the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Good morning. Wow. All right, then. So, who has the bag this morning? That's right. Oh, this is not a bag. So, is it, is it on the paper towel, or what's in the paper towel? Inside. Did you do this last minute because you forgot? No? All right, here we go. We're going to unwrap it. You think you know what it is? You want to do it? Oh. <laughs> All right, then. Oh. How'd you know that's what it was? Because he has a lot of them in his room. All right. What is it? Chapstick. Who said chapstick? Arvo. Arvo. It, there are, it does kind of look like a bottle of chapstick, but it's not. It's yeah, it's a shell, right? So, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So, does anybody think they know what kind of shell this is? Shotgun. It's a shotgun shell. Do you know what size? No. Somebody maybe younger? Nobody? What do you think? No, you, you would think it's a 12 gauge, right? 12 gauge is a little bit bigger, so this is a what? 20 gauge. It's a 20 gauge, so it's a little bit smaller. What would happen if we were to put this in the 12 gauge? Wouldn't fit, wouldn't work properly. Now, what's significant about this particular shell? Okay, it's yellow. What else? It's used. It's used. So how many of you think that now that it's been used, this should be thrown away? Obviously not Jonathan. <laughs> right? Because he has many of them in his room. What were you going to say? You should think it was going to be thrown away, yeah. Yeah. So, so the ones that you, you use, you throw them away, right? Yeah. What, it, could it be reloaded at a significantly lower price? Why, yes, it could. Here's the thing. Sometimes we think we're done. Confirmation students, sometimes we think we're done. Oh, confirmation's over. I have arrived. The truth is, though, that we're never done. We're never over. God continues to reuse us over and over and over again. One of the beautiful things about God and what he does is he's considered efficient. Have you ever noticed sometimes one thing will happen, but God will use that one thing for several different purposes, for several different people. Like, one time, uh, you would think that God would use pastor to take somebody fishing to have a good time. But he actually uses it to make sure the other person knows how to swim. I couldn't resist. I got pictures to prove it, actually. So... The next time you're out shooting, how many of you shoot, by the way? Raise your hand if you, if you shoot. Next time, you, next time you're out shooting, and, or you see a shell, and it's been spent, remember and continue to remember that God is never finished with us. Sometimes we think we're done. Sometimes we think that the thing that we're, uh, purp our purpose even, is, well, I've, I've been used and... Now I don't have a purpose. That's not the truth. Until our life is over, until we stop breathing, God continually has a purpose for us. And so as we transition through stages of our life, confirmants are going from a stage where they were learning uh, the fundamentals of faith, and now not only are they going to be using those fundamentals of faith every day, just like all of us, they're also moving into a new school, right? They're going off into high school now. So that stage in their life has a lot of changes. And obviously we recognize that God's not done with us. So think about that. Good job, Jonathan.
And then this is for blowing your nose. All right, arms out, arms together. Lord God, thank you that you define us and that you continually use us over and over and over again. Thank you for never being done with us, that you continue to stretch us and grow us and that we can continue to seek after you. And even though we think we understand, there are so many more things you long to teach us throughout our life. Thank you for today that we get to celebrate your activity in our life. Thank you for the confirmation students. Thank you for faith that you instill in us. So Lord God, keep us close to you and never let us wander. In your holy and precious name, amen. Jordan, where'd he go? Oh, I, I didn't recognize you in your shirt and tie. My disguise, Eli Karen. Eli Karen next week, all right? Okay, you guys can have a seat. Well, we are working our way through Galatians, and while we took a pause last week for Mother's Day, we're back in Galatians for our message today. Today's message comes from Galatians chapter 2. It's verses 1 through 10, and because it hasn't been read yet this morning, I'll go ahead and read it as we begin here, and then I'll pray. Then, after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. It was because of a revelation that I went up, and I submitted to them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. But I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel, to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For he who effectively worked in Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Let's pray. Jesus, would you give us now understanding? We are in need of your word and your message, not mine. What a wonderful day it is to be reminded of the gospel and the grace of God, that even in learning, you bring understanding. Open our hearts and our minds now to your message and speak. May your word and spirit move actively and mighty among us, Lord Jesus, for you are good. May you be glorified. In your precious name, Jesus, amen. The title for today's message is, is Freedom in Christ. And I speak to that because this is the heart of what's happening in Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. We talk about Christian freedom uh, a lot. In, in Lutheranism, uh, it tends to be more focused. Uh, think of Luther, who talked about Christian freedom all the time and uh, was a man who loved his beer, for an example. We've grown up, some of you have grown up in a church that seemed legalistic, where playing cards was frowned upon. Maybe even some of you remember the days that, that dancing was a no-no. But what is Christian freedom? 
What is freedom at all? I often explain that, that freedom is an illusion. When we use the word free or freedom, we often think that it means that we are free to do whatever we want. But is that the case? Um, if you think you are free to do whatever you want, there's a man in this room you must talk to. Yeah, Dean? Huh? Just because we live in a free country does not give us the freedom to do anything we so choose. So what is it that we say when we say that the United States is a free country? What are we speaking of? To be free means to be freed from something, right? But what we speak of is the fact that we've been freed from the king. That we are a country that can govern itself. But in that governing of itself, there are laws. Where does freedom begin and end for each person? Yeah? Am I free to do whatever I want if it encroaches on your freedom to do whatever you want? What, where does all of this lie? Well, sometimes when we speak of Christian freedom, our focus tends to be on the things that we are able to do, that we feel that it's okay to participate in because we have Christian freedom. The reality, however, is that there's one thing when we speak of Christian freedom that we are freed from. And this is what Paul speaks about today. As he went to Jerusalem after 14 years of already ministering, he takes Barnabas and Titus with him and he meets with Peter James, who is the patriarch at the time, the brother of Jesus, and the Apostle John. As they present the gospel that they've been preaching, this is the gospel that was revealed to Paul while he was on the road, and what he's been preaching to those who are uncircumcised, to the Gentiles. Some people in the church had come in who were of Jewish origin, the circumcised, and were trying to compel the church that they needed to continually have the right of circumcision in Christianity. Paul opposes this. What is it then that Paul is opposing? What is it that Paul is speaking to that we have freedom from? If there's anything that I can give to you today, which it wouldn't be me, right? Terrible statement. If there's anything that I hope for you to grasp from today's text, would be that you recognize that it's not freedom to but it's freedom from. What does it mean that Jesus paid it all? Do you have a debt? Do you have any, does anybody here have a debt that if it was called into collection this very day, they're not sure what they would do to pay it? That is freedom. But it's not monetary. It's not of <clears throat> subject to materialism, right? It's not the freedom to own a vehicle and not have a debt. It's not about your house. 
It's about your soul. What the people who had snuck into the church in Galatians longed for was to be defined by the law. What does it mean to be freed from the law? Because you've been freed from the law, and yet, it's pretty clear in Scripture that Jesus says, if you don't follow what my Father says, then you don't really love me. So, is it okay to go murder your neighbor? I mean, we're freed from the law, aren't we? How many of you, how many of you still would, wouldn't play cards? How many of you won't raise your hand that you do play cards in the church? <laughs> Where do we draw this line? If somebody smokes a cigarette, does that mean they're going to hell? How we judge others should be applied to our own self. The amount and the weight in which we judge others, we should judge ourselves in what we do. Am I free to do whatever I want? What happened here, as Paul begins to explain, and, and you've noticed that I'm not preaching uh, expository as I normally typically do, because this is just a description of what's taking place. But what is taking place is that people are trying to say the only way you can be defined is by completing the law. And so while Christ died for your sins, while he fulfilled the whole will and law of God in, uh, in your place, you still must be circumcised. In other words, you still must follow and complete the law for yourself. Do we not do this all the time? How many of you, when you look at God, you wonder if he's happy with you because of the way you perform as a Christian? How often do we teach our children that the reason that we are happy with them is because they obey? And so in the same way, we often teach our children that God becomes happy with us because we perform. How many of you, when you were in school, got to make a nice clay thing for your parents? Right? I made ashtrays because my parents smoked, but maybe you made doorstops or... I don't know, maybe you made an ornament that went on a tree. Tell me, when you made that thing, did your parents love it? Yeah, they did. Was it because it looked fabulous? <laughs> nope. When God looks at us, he's not happy with us because... We're perfect. In fact, we just look like a big lump of clay that's been in rough shape. But he's happy with us because of what he's done on the cross in our place. He's able to look at us and be satisfied with us because Christ paid the punishment for the law. So why is it that if we've been freed from the law that says that we no longer have to complete it to be satisfying to God, that in some way we still are compelled to do it? It's because we're not free to do whatever we want. I want to be the best person I can be.
And if I'm kidding and joking, that, that's better than most of you guys. No, the reality is it's far less, right? It's far less. When we begin to look at ourselves, what do we find? There's nothing in us that makes us acceptable to God. That the reason that you even are able to decide to follow Jesus is because he's done something in you. And he's instilled in you the faith that it takes to say yes. And so we say yes. So when we think of Christian freedom, the thing is, is we've been freed from the law because its weight tells us we must complete it. Because if we don't follow it, if we're not measured by it, then there is no other standard. But the measurement is far too high. You're that little kid that gets to go to Six Flags. And you're just this short. So you get to watch all your siblings ride on the cool rides. We're not enough. We don't measure up. But just because Christ fulfilled the whole will and law of God in our place doesn't give us the ability to do whatever we want. What it gives us is the ability to come before the throne of grace. It gives us the ability to stand before the cross. It gives us the ability, as it says in Ephesians, to stand before him holy and blameless in his love. Because that's what defines you. Now that you've been defined as free, what will you do with your freedom? Oh, I'm going to follow Jesus. Right? And when I do, as I do, I'm going to fail. As I follow Jesus, and, and as hard as I follow him, there will be somebody that I hurt. There will be somebody... I disappoint and I speak to you as your pastor knowing this is who I am and if I'm this way I know you're that way because we're all the same we are sinners saved by grace we've not been perfected on this side of heaven but we stand in somebody else's perfection this is what defines me this is who I am not the sum of my past mistakes, but the sum of his perfection. And I can say that I am a child of God. I can say that I'm in his family, imperfected as I am. Thankfully, he sees me as perfect for the grace of God, for the grace of Christ, and for the gospel. So, is it wrong for one to think that it's okay to have a beer? And another says, you know, I don't think that that's necessarily the best thing to do. Who's right? Technically, they both are. We've been freed to, from the law, but we've also been freed from it so that we can walk in it. And in walking in it, it won't be perfect. If you do not struggle, for an example, and I don't speak on this often. I don't like to speak on this. It's not my favorite thing. In fact, I don't look forward to this message at all. But if drinking a beer for you is not a problem, then it's not a problem. But there are things that I know that I cannot do, that I should stay away from. And that, for me, are traps that Satan will use to manipulate me. And you know what he does with that manipulation? You know what he says? You're not enough. See, I told you. I knew it. And because you failed, because you fell, you don't really believe. I am so grateful that Satan doesn't get to define my belief. That my belief, my trust, and my faith is defined by one person and one person alone. 
and that is Christ. If it was defined by the law, what would happen? I wouldn't even be standing up here. It's because of the completed work of Christ that I'm free. But that doesn't mean I'm free to do whatever I want. What it does is it gives me the freedom to follow. It gives me the freedom to say yes. It gives me the freedom to say I've decided. So this morning, while singing that song is almost, for me, a struggle. Guess what? Confirmants, this morning you get to say, I've decided. And it gets to be true. And it gets to be correct. And there's nothing wrong with saying it. Why? Because you did decide. And the freedom to decide was found in the gospel. So as you live your life, each and every one of you, you will be compelled to pick up the law again. To be defined by it. So that God would be happy with you because you completed it. Deny that, as Paul denies it here. That what makes God happy with you is found in the completion of the law in Christ. And so it is by faith alone and grace alone that God becomes happy with you. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. So daily then, what your life is, is to be reminded as you fail and as you succeed, it's only by him. Nothing else gives you freedom. And in that freedom, you can choose. So please do, over and over, every day, decide to follow Jesus. This is Christian freedom. Lord Jesus, thank you for freeing us from the thing that would bind us, the thing that sentenced us, the thing that claimed us for who we were. But now we have been redefined. And because you freed us, we can choose. And so this day we decide and Lord, where we struggle in our faith and in our belief, for those who may have not decided, for those who struggle in that decision, Lord God, may it be that we recognize you've decided for us if we would just accept. Because the working of the cross was done 2,000 years ago, and I cannot change it. So today, teach us just to accept it for what it is. May we be receivers, Lord, and choosers, Thank you that your will, what you've done, and perfection in your completion is what defines us. Continue to be our all in all. In Jesus' name, amen. As we get ready to have fellowship with one another and fellowship with Christ, for those of you who are visiting, our common practice, our communion practice, our common, our communion practice is listed on the back of this insert. If you believe as we believe that Jesus Christ is really present, we long for you to come forward and to take part in fellowship as we receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ, where he is truly, really present and feeds us and strengthens us in such the way. Today, uh, we will have the confirmants and their families come forward first, and then the ushers will guide everybody else forward. So we will begin. In the night in which he was betrayed, Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples. After he had broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. In the same manner, he took the cup, and after he had supped, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, drink of it, all of you. This is the New Testament in my blood shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink of it, all of you, and as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Let us join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The ushers will guide you forward. Though I can't describe how, nor do I know exactly how he does it, or I do know this. As we take part in communion, we have fellowship with one another and fellowship with him. It's undeniable, as he has encouraged our soul, that something has happened. So, I remember the first time I took part in communion as a believer. So today we are reminded in confirmation and in communion that we are his and he is ours and we are one together and one with him. Would you please rise and receive the benediction? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.
serve the 